For Cybercrime Radio, I'm Heather Engel. This is Cybertide, a cybercrime magazine podcast series brought to you by AdLumen. Working to revolutionize the way organizations secure sensitive data, AdLumen finds the newest cracks being exploited and shines a light on correcting the issue in real time with expert guidance. To learn more about our sponsor, visit adlumen.com. That's A-D-L-U-M-I-N.com. I'm talking today with Mark Sangster. Mark is the Vice President, Chief of Strategy at AdLumen. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure, Heather. Today, we're talking about the concrete financial impacts that result from cyber incidents. This is something that can be very tricky to quantify. So I'd like to ask you first about the threat environment that companies are operating in today. What has changed and what stands out as particularly notable to you? Yeah, for me, it's really just the overarching industrialization of cyber criminals, right? So these ransomware as a service gangs, and I almost dislike that term because gang sounds like a bunch of ruffians staking out their turf in a bad neighborhood. <laughs> They're not. They're syndicated. They're an organization, right? They're as structured, I suppose, as, you know, a Fortune 500 company, which is why I jokingly call them the misfortune 500. And their skills and the, the sort of the tactics, techniques, and procedures that they use have advanced, right? The phishing lures, for example, are far more sophisticated. They resonate with insiders within a particular industry. So think of it like social engineering 2.0. You know, they have a much better idea of what your business looks like, what terminology you use, what's going to push your buttons, right? Who are your regulators, et cetera. And they're really good at living off the land, right? Understanding what technology you use, understanding, you know, the sort of the core banking tools that you might have, you know, who you might be partnered with when it comes to things like if you're in the banking side, it can be, you know, ATMs, for example. A lot of those times those are managed by a third party or other marketing services might be. Or if you're on the investment, you know, hedge fund side, they know about Bloomberg terminals. They know how it works. They know about limited partners, all that kind of thing. And, you know, lastly, I've seen a real advancement in sort of the takedown of initial access defense tools. So things like MFA, for example, not that I'm advocating you can turn it off or should turn it off, but they're good at bypassing that. So you kind of have to push deeper into the attack life cycle to really identify the signs and symptoms that you're in your environment. And far too often those companies, you know, take too long to do that and it's too late. So a recent Wall Street Journal article surveyed compliance professionals and they identified cybersecurity as the biggest risk. And you and I have been in this field for a long time, and we know that that's something that was not the case five years ago. This puts cyber risk above geopolitical, regulatory, digitization, supply chain even, and now required disclosures for companies mean attack details will be more public. What are the financial impacts here? Does this mean companies will be spending more or are forced to spend more on cybersecurity? Do they want to now that cyber risk has been identified as the biggest risk? Yeah, definitely. Right. I think that when it comes to sort of fiduciary care or fiduciary obligation of any organization, particularly finance, we've thought in traditional terms. Right. And, you know, most of the compliance rules and regulations, they're kind of, for the most part, internal looking or that's where they came from. Right. The idea was that someone with privileged access and access to information could do something wrong. And so we put monitoring control and you think about the fraud controls and Sarbanes-Oxley and a whole bunch of other things that are out there, you know, in the financial public world. And the compliance rules for cybersecurity, you know, unfortunately, now that they're starting to face outwards and think about criminals maliciously doing something right, intentionally doing something wrong or trying to break in and gain unauthorized access, they're always behind. Right. The criminals have first mover advantage, which means, you know, a lot of times the compliance standards that are there are kind of reflecting the past. And now that we're into the future, the bad guys have moved on and are doing something else. And the reality is that compliance and security overlap but they're not 100% overlap. And you could be 100% compliant and 100% owned at the same time. Now, you can look at it from a fiduciary perspective of, you know, it's like taxes, death and taxes, right? They're inevitable. (laughs) So do you want to pay now or do you want to pay later? And that's the thing I think with security is that we're sort of coming out of that era of, well, I wanted to the absolute minimum. I'm not going to overspend here. What's the point? As long as I check those boxes, like I said, well, no one can blame me. And the reality is it's going beyond that, right? They're starting to say, yeah, the guidelines are there. It's like having guardrails and speed limits and seatbelts. But at the end of the day, you're still responsible as the driver of the vehicle and its owner. So I think that's sort of shifting. So financially, we're starting to see, obviously, things like penalties, the costs of audits, lost customers, potential lawsuits, making those customers whole. And as you said, when you talked about the exposure piece, you're absolutely right. 
as we push towards that kind of proactive transparency. And what I mean by that is it used to be like on the legal side, it's almost like, well, if you didn't ask the right question, you're not going to get the answer you were looking for. Now they're putting the onus on the financial institution to say, hey, you have to bring this forward. You have to declare this and attest. And what that means is, like I said, the onus is on them. And I think so is the liability. So some of these cases where maybe we paid people off in the background, and I don't mean to imply it's legal. I just mean like customer A was affected. And so customer A was made whole. Customers B to Z had no idea that it ever happened. Those days are starting to narrow and I think, you know, are coming to an end, which is probably a good thing so that everyone understands, even if they weren't directly impacted, that there was a likelihood or a possibility that that could have happened so that they can make an informed decision, right? Maybe they want to stay or maybe they don't. And I think that ultimately the customer pressure is going to, I think, drive more than that kind of regulator pressure that's sort of been this, like I said, it's like, I'm going to do the absolute minimum. You know, it's like that. Are you working hard or hardly working? <laughs> it feels like it's the latter when it comes to compliance, but I think it'll become the former when it comes to customer demand. Yeah, you said something that I want to go back to, which is the pay now versus pay later. And I think when we're talking about this topic, one of the things that we look at, right, is the risk management and the reputation management. And we can quantify what it's going to cost to pay now, but it's a lot harder to quantify things if you choose to pay later, like reputational risk and how the regulations might have changed and what kind of fines and fees are going to be in place. So with that in mind, how does this challenge organizations to reevaluate their cybersecurity strategies, including understanding and mitigating business risks in today's digital landscape? Yeah, good question. So what I always start off when I talk to, you know, executives and then non-technical business leaders, you know, the boards and so on in a financial institution, managing partners, is let's look at the risk that you face and understand it, right? And think about the operational risks, the business risks, and the financial risks. You know, the financial ones are the obvious ones, right? Penalties, business loss, reputational would be fall under business, but it's going to affect financial. And I think the place to start there is like work with the associations, right? Work with the NCUA, work with your local, you know, community groups. There are tons of those groups out there that, you know, like I said, for community banks, for credit unions and so on. And they have a lot of information around things like how much does cyber insurance cost? What are the averages paying for? Often they'll have preferred vendors that you can work with for things like to reduce your security operations cost or to make sure that you get a reasonable premium through an insurer for that kind of indemnification and so on. But truly understanding that. And then also, I think, looking at the peer damages. And the reason I say that is, you know, it's hard to be a community bank in, let's say, New Mexico and look at a big bank or, you know, some other financial institution in New York or California that is hit. And we see these seven, eight, nine zeros kind of penalties and losses and put that into a scale that you can understand. Right. It's like infinity. Human mind just can't do infinity. The more we think about it, the more our minds get bent. And it's the same kind of concept for them. So they look at it and then they blow it away, right? As soon as you just can't understand it, you just go, ah, whatever. This is FUD. This is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. You're scaremongering, whatever. It won't happen to me, right? We all have that. There's got to be a name for that bias, right? That it's only going to happen to my neighbor, never to me <laughs> kind of default. But I think once they understand what it costs a credit union that's been affected or, like I said, a community bank or a hedge fund. And the one thing I do see in investment groups is that they're far more wary because they don't have a large public as a consumer base. They have all these limited partners, all these limited investors who put in 150 million or whatever it might be. And those people walk and talk with their bank accounts. So, you know, if something bad happens, they pull their money. You know, there's a run on the bank per se. And, you know, within 24 or 48 hours, that institution's gone because their investors dried up and their money's been pulled. So for them, they're very aware of what the damage of reputation can be. I think for other institutions, like I said, more of the consumer facing ones, they're less so. And then if we go into the insurance world itself, ironically, you have this completely open model through brokers and dealers. And, you know, those brokers are running around with Best Buy Geek Squad laptops and no idea about security. I mean, I've looked at some of those tools in the past two years ago now. I don't know what they're like right now. So don't quote me. But, you know, they wouldn't even support MFA and single sign on at the time. 
So you look at that kind of stuff, and that's terrifying to think of all those applications with all that financial information, social security numbers and all that stuff in there that don't necessarily go anywhere. Think about, I don't know what the number is, but let's say for every person who applies to, you know, get a life insurance, you probably have 20 applicants with all those records sitting on a dealer's laptop, and maybe one of them actually goes through the contract and it ends up on the insurance side. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor. AdLumen Inc. provides enterprise-grade security to mid-market organizations. Its security operations platform and managed detection and response services combines all your data into one view to illuminate security risks and accelerate security workflows. Security teams are often stretched thin and are faced with increasing threats to respond to like ransomware and data theft. AdLumen's patented technology simplifies these challenges by providing organizations with machine learning detection and automated response capabilities to halt threats quickly. The platform also includes threat hunting, automated incident response, vulnerability management, honeypots, darknet exposure monitoring, compliance reporting and monitoring, and more. Join the conversation and see how AdLumen can enhance your security program without increasing your workload. Visit adlumen.com. And now back to the podcast. You mentioned credit unions, and there's a really interesting case study on Ed Lumen's website that I want to talk about for a second regarding managed detection and response. What are some cyber challenges that managed detection and response can help with, particularly for these organizations that maybe don't have the resources of a big bank? Yeah, so that's a great point, right? The problem is that little businesses still have big business problems, right? It doesn't matter how you want to measure that. Employee numbers, revenue, AUM, assets under management like they would in finance. You know, the reality is bad guys are really good at going after you. And frankly, community banks and credit unions have become pretty good pickings, right? They can defraud you in transfers. They can shut down systems and extort you through ransomware and ransom shutdowns, et cetera. So the real challenge here is, as I say, there are plenty of signs and symptoms or signals before a massive event occurs that could have told you it was there, that it was going to happen, right? And all too often I hear this, the executives like, well, you know, everything was great on Friday and by Sunday we were shut down. And the problem with that is all those signs and signals are going to be detected or discovered by the insurance company when they come in and they bring in an incident response firm that kind of does the forensics, right? That, you know, (laughs) puts the chalk around the bodies and all those little numbered cards and, you know, starts collecting all the evidence in the forensics. And so If we can flip that narrative and say, well, that's kind of the bad news sort of way of putting it. Well, the good news is there's lots of signs and signals that they're in your environment. And so if you can spot them and then you can deal with them and you can do that in a timely manner, because time is probably the most valuable commodity when it comes to cybersecurity, then you can stop it in early stages. And that's where managed detection response comes in. 24-7 24-7 as a turnkey service, it's monitoring the entire environment. And in fact, Ed Lumen started in banking and finance. So we actually have patents for how we monitor the core banking tools. And when you see what's going on, you can kind of put the context to it. You can say, well, hang on, this user is doing something strange from an odd location. The traffic is more traffic than they typically generate, whatever it might be. And you can dive in and then you can block it, reset an account, you know, shut off remote access if they're working remotely disable their device, like their laptop or whatever it might be. And it's very surgical in that approach. And so you're not really affecting the business. You're not shutting it down. You're allowing it to continue its normal operations, but you're only sort of sidelining those that you think have been affected or infected in this case. And that's important because the reality is you cannot build that kind of operation that in, you know, 35 seconds can start to triage a threat or an alert and within 10 to 15 minutes contain it and shut it down. There's no way they're hiring that level of staff. And even if they could find those people, they can't retain them. And then they'd have to build all the tools and the infrastructure to do it. And that's where MDR, I said, as a turnkey, provides that service for them. So it brings big business, big bank security to the small, medium-sized organizations like those community banks and like those credit unions. So we like to, on this podcast, also talk about some tangible things that companies can do to manage cyber risk. Beyond MDR, When it comes to security operations, what are some other tools or even reports that would enhance awareness and improve our odds against our attacker? So first, start with the ISAC groups, the Information Sharing and Analysis Centers, right? There's, what, 17 or 18 of them now that keep growing. They're mandated by the government. There's the financial services one. Within those are subgroups or ISAOs, you know, analysis organizations that focus on things like community banks or credit unions, et cetera. The NCUA, I'm throwing out a lot of alphabet soup today. They will do that as well. So look at that and understand what the threats look like. 
do the basics, man, brush and floss. So proper passwords, multi-factor authentication, identity management systems, least privilege, backing up systems and proper segmentation. And the big one I see in banks or financial institutions, they use a lot of consultants. So make sure you are onboarding and offboarding those people and those accounts that they have, because often you're bringing in technical people and they move on with their life. And yet their username and their password that had all those great administrative rights into the heart of your organization are still live. And bad guys are great at stealing those and using them. So do the fundamentals. But ultimately for the leaders, understand the risk, right? Sit down with somebody who knows about this, understand what it looks like, get them to walk you through the legal landscape as well. So you see both sides of it and then help guide them as to where do they put their money, right? Because they've got limited resources. So this is about spending it effectively rather than, you know, I don't think any of them have this, but, you know, there are companies I see that try to do the Noah's Ark, you know, two of everything kind of approach. <laughs> and I don't think it works either. Well, as always, Mark, this has been really interesting. Thanks for being on the podcast. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Oh, Heather, you're very, very welcome. It's always a pleasure to work together. And, you know, this is another one, right? We're seeing a lot of attacks right now going on in the financial institutions. So I'm happy to chat with you today and get the word out. For Cybercrime Radio, I'm Heather Engel. Cybertide is a cybercrime magazine podcast series brought to you by AdLumen. Working to revolutionize the way organizations secure sensitive data, AdLumen finds the newest cracks being exploited and shines a light on correcting the issue in real time with expert guidance. To learn more about our sponsor, visit adlumen.com. That's A-D-L-U-M-I-N.com.